So here we are, and as is customary for the first quarter of the year, there's been very few games for us to get our hands onto lately. So today, instead of talking about a hot new release, I thought we could talk about something a little more retro. Well, at least something that pretends to be retro. I don't know, it's kind of confusing. Are people calling the Wii U retro yet? What? No one even knows what a Wii U is anymore? Alright, yeah, that's fair enough. Today we're talking about Shovel Knight! There's very few people in the gaming world that aren't at least aware of Shovel Knight's presence, but just in case you aren't, let me fill you in. Shovel Knight's impact and his contribution to indie games as a whole has been felt pretty much everywhere ever since the release of his game, and the large amount of crossover appearances he's amassed over the years has put him right on the edge of becoming a household name. That being said though, I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there who never got around to playing Shovel Knight, and are probably pretty confused as to why such a conventional, old-school platformer is so universally praised. Sure, the amount of places that Shovel Knight has has managed to pop up is getting a bit ridiculous now, but there must be a pretty good reason that so many developers are willing to put him in their games in the first place. And the truth is, Shovel Knight is really just that good. The age we live in has a seemingly infinite amount of games for us to play, and that can make it much harder than it used to be to go back to a game that we may have missed out on during its initial release. But in this case, would it be worth it to pick up a controller and go back to see where all of this shovel mania started? Well, lucky for you, I've gone back to play Shovel Knight to help determine if it's a title that's worth going back to all of these years later. So, whether you're already a diehard fan of shovel platforming already, or a complete novice in the art of the spade, strap in, because today we'll be answering the simple question of, did you miss out on Shovel Knight? Let's dig in. I should get my channel taken away for that, shouldn't I? Shovel Knight was born where all good video games are first shown off to the world, Kickstarter. Wait, what? Okay, maybe that's not so true. Unlike some other titles that had previously graced the platform, Shovel Knight had a monumentally successful Kickstarter campaign that met an insane amount of stretch goals in the spring of 2013. What many fans didn't realize during the Kickstarter campaign though was the lengths that Yacht Club Games, the developer, was willing to go to when adding in these extra modes and playable characters as stretch goals. What many people assumed would just be bonus content on an already full campaign would soon be revealed as projects much closer to entirely new games. Shovel Knight fully released just over a year later in June of 2014, and Yacht Club spent the next five years steadily delivering on this crazy amount of Kickstarter promises. Five years for updates to an indie platformer game. Yacht Club just continued to add more and more of these promise modes to the game, and all of it was completely free! This stream of content was supplied at zero cost for any original Kickstarter backers, and even any fans who picked up Shovel Knight between its original release and May 30th of 2017, which is a full three years after the game came out. I cannot emphasize enough how insanely generous this is of Yacht Club, and unheard of in the entire gaming industry. As I already said, these weren't just little side missions and extra things to do in the game, these were basically standalone titles titles that were just being given out for free to anyone who purchased the game within three years. Now, of course, these stretch goals should obviously be owed to anyone who helped fund the original campaign, but to continue to offer them as free add-ons for new buyers is just absolutely crazy. The project was very clearly driven by passion from the beginning, and it's a passion that shines through in each and every update that came to the game over its five-year lifespan. After all, there's a reason that they only finished adding to the game in December of 2019. Not only is there an insane amount of content that has been added to the game, but you also have to consider that most of it is at an unbelievably high level of quality. In its completed state, Shovel Knight now boasts four campaigns that each have a different playable character with move sets and unique tools to use, as well as a Smash Brothers style platform fighting party mode on the side. Altogether, that's five full indie games that come tightly packed into the Shovel Knight treasure trove, which is pretty hard to beat. Most storefronts even give you the option of buying the game separately too. It'll cost you a bit more of course, but it's a good alternative for anyone who's hesitant to buy the treasure trove and go all in. But I don't recommend that the games are really good, just go all in! This treasure trove package is great, but it's far too much content for me to talk about in one video. So for today, I'm only going to focus on what you were getting when you picked up Shovel Knight in its original state in 2014. But hey, that does bring up a good point. If you do want me to talk about the rest of the campaigns, tell me in a comment down below and like the video to let me know you like when I talk about Shovel Knight. I know everyone on YouTube does this, but they give you this stat of 
how many people are subscribed to your videos versus how many people are watching it unsubscribed. And just by me being here telling you to subscribe, more people will do it. It is proven, it will happen. It is a free thing you can do on the website to see videos you like. If you like this video, consider subscribing. That's all I'm gonna say, let's move on. So as I was saying, in order to get a full understanding of how Shovel Knight began his crusade to become an indie game icon, today we'll be looking at the original standalone launch title, Shovel Knight, Shovel of Hope. In the beginning, this is all there was to Shovel Knight, a single campaign that could be completed in a few hours if you weren't actively trying to collect everything, and yet people still went nuts for it. As I said before, each of the game's campaigns sees you take control of a different character in the Shovel Knight universe, but it probably won't surprise you to learn that the original adventure has you play as none other than Shovel Knight himself. Armed with your trusty shovel, and a few other trinkets we can talk about later. It's your job to save Shovel Knight's partner, Shield Knight, who has been locked in the Tower of Fate after a quest for some treasure goes wrong. So, Shovel Knight must defeat the Empress and her eight best knights, known as the Order of No Quarter, in order to break Shield Knight free and continue their merry adventuring ways. Not the most complex storyline, sure, but it gets the job done. You do get a bit more story through other parts of the game, like the boss's dialogue, but at the end of the day, the story's really not why we're here. It's never been an issue as to why Mario has to rescue Peach for the 800th time. Like, seriously, it happened again? You're a princess, for God's sake! Just lock the door! Similarly to the story in a Mario game, things are kept to a minimum here. Rescuing Peach is used as a simple and straightforward way to motivate the much more important element of the game, the actual gameplay. You take away Peach to make our little plumber friend run to the right until he reaches the end of the game. That's all the player needs to understand, and it's not really any different here in Shovel Knight. Shovel Knight also manages to take the best part of the classic NES games we know and love and expand on their mechanics and gameplays while simultaneously leaving any of their flaws behind. And if that sounds too good to be true, well, it's not. It's right here, just play this game. For example, Mega Man is known for its tight controls and colorful and creative bosses at the end of each stage, which Shovel Knight emulates, but also personalizes in a couple different ways. The boss fights that wait for you at the end of each stage are some of the best you'll find in any 2D platformer. Similarly to Mega Man, the levels in Shovel Knight are representations of their boss's theme, but I found the Shovel Knight levels to be much more enthralling and creative than any of the ones to be found in the classic Mega Man games. All the stages in Shovel Knight tell stories on their own, which makes your time spent within them all the more memorable and more enjoyable. The ice level isn't just a basic snow-themed mountaintop or something, it extends into being based around Vikings and has these wooden ships you're running through all over the place. Then, later in the level, it takes the theme even further by reaching into Norse mythology. It has these rainbow platforms that are based on the Bifrost, which was the bridge that connected Asgard to Earth. So when deciding to make an ice level, instead of just thinking the theme was ice, they connected ice to Vikings, then connected Vikings to Norse mythology. It's easy to fall into design traps and think that an ice-themed stage is a strong enough choice to carry a level through to completion, but a stage can become so much more interesting and lovable once you can add multiple layers of similar, yet different, stylistic choices on top of each other. Yacht Club truly spared no expense in creating levels that feel justified in their gimmicks when you finally get to see the boss at the end, and they're not afraid to really go outside of the box sometimes. These Mega Man style encounters take place in stages that are entirely themed around each boss, so it feels really rewarding to make it to the boss arena and finally see who the puppet master behind all of your platforming woes is. On my original playthrough, I found myself wondering what was waiting for me at the end of each level immediately after entering the stages, and I have to say I was more than pleased with the diversity and creativity in the boss's designs. For example, after trekking through the snow level, Polar Knight ended up being a large viking character who also wields a shovel. But unlike our hero Shovel Knight, his was a snow shovel. The designs for the Order of No Quarter is one of Shovel Knight's biggest strengths, and I think they were well aware of that, playing off it even more once the entirety of the treasure trove was released, letting you play as all of them. The bright colors and unique silhouettes of each character really helps to make each boss stand out, and they're all equally as memorable as each other by the end of the game. So when you look back to Mega Man and see, you know, Woodman, for example, and he's in a forest, and now it's underground, and back up into the forest, and there's the boss. Like, I get it, but 
Is that it? Why not start the level with robots of animals like rabbits, but then transition into having some industrial machinery as a mid-boss or buzzsaws to avoid? I understand that the NES had limits, but I feel like there was definitely more that could be done here than he's made of wood, wood comes from the forest, boom, done, send it to print. There's a few other places that Shovel Knight pulls inspiration from as well. There's a power-up that allows you to shoot a magic missile while at full health, like in the original Zelda, and this downward stab that you use for most of the game is straight out of Zelda 2. Also mixed into the Shovel Knight package is the secondary weapons, called relics, which are a great way to shake up the gameplay akin to the power-ups you would find in Castlevania. Something Shovel Knight does different with its relics, though, is the ability to keep them as permanent upgrades, even through death. You'll find these relics by exploring hidden rooms, and not only are you able to keep them for the rest of the game, eliminating the frustration of falling into a pit after you just managed to get decked out with your favorite cross, you can even later buy them from town if you happen to miss any, so there's no reason to sweat if you didn't quite comb through every stage as carefully as you thought. The relics also have the added benefit of being a soft difficulty adjustment for each player. The levels are completely possible to complete without using any relics at all, so if you're looking for a more hardcore experience, you can choose to completely ignore them. Although I will warn you, if you do try to make it through the whole game without using relics, things can get NES hard pretty quickly. It's pretty incredible how well Shovel Knight is able to take all these elements and styles from all across gaming's history, really, and combine them together into one cohesive gameplay style. It's a big, beautiful sort of mixing pot of all these different things that shouldn't work together and haven't in the past, but it gives the game its own unique style and feeling when you play it in the best kind of way. I don't know why it works, but it just does. And, I mean, it's kind of hard to describe, but... That's the best I can do, just play the game yourself, I don't know. Now I know what you might be thinking. If Shovel Knight just borrows a bunch of older mechanics from games that are already good on their own, what is it about Shovel Knight that makes it so special then? Well, gameplay is one thing, but there's also the art direction and general polish of the game that really makes Shovel Knight stand out from among the crowd. After playing for your first few minutes, it immediately becomes clear that Shovel Knight doesn't only take inspiration from the games of yesteryear, but it feels right at home sitting next to them. Aside from some extra visual effects that give the game some 21st century pizzazz, the core gameplay of Shovel Knight is classic Nintendo action platforming at its finest, and it's a game that could have easily existed on the NES with little to no changes. It does cheat in a few ways, the parallax scrolling in these backgrounds is way too complex, and the NES couldn't actually render any of these colors, so... Do you have any idea what kind of processing that requires? As you may expect, you'll spend most of your time running through the game's various stages and finish things off by fighting the big bad boss that's waiting for you at the end. Simple? Yes. Overdone? Possibly. But I think that's okay here. Shovel Knight knows what it aims to do with its gameplay, and in most cases, does it miles better than the competition. You'll dig, smack, and bounce your way across colorful, pixelated environments that are simply a joy to work your way through. Shovel Knight is just a visually striking game all around. It's got vibrant colors and diverse environments everywhere you look. The art direction is just so polished. There's a certain unique quality in the pixel art that gives the game its own great style, and I don't know exactly what it is, but it just looks like Shovel Knight. There's also visual elements of the game that have pretty direct ties to the NES classics. There's the Mario Bros. 3 style world map, and the font for pickups is the same as Zelda 2's. And even though these are only small touches, they still go a long way in making the game feel like it's decades older than it actually is. And, if nothing else, these are just nice little hits of nostalgia. Shovel Knight's ties to the NES go far beyond just the visual stylings of the game though. Mega Man really is the closest point of comparison, but there is also one other major difference between Shovel Knight and Mega Man, being that Shovel Knight's basic move set is entirely based on close range. Yeah, there's no cannon attached to your arm to keep you out of danger here, so don't be afraid to get up close and personal with all the baddies you encounter in this one. Every time you face off with an enemy, it feels a lot more threatening when you know you have to get into shovel range in order to take them down. And although this isn't an objectively better design over Mega Man's jump and shoot style, I think it feels a lot better to plan your strikes carefully and dance in and out of an enemy's range, as opposed to mindlessly tapping away at the A button even if nothing is in front of you. Like, there's not really any reason to not be shooting in Mega Man, right? Eventually something will jump out at you and run into your bullets, so why not be prepared? In Shovel Knight, you have to be a lot more methodical in your attacks, because swinging the shovel will halt your momentum, which is a pretty serious penalty when your entire end goal of the game is just move to the right. The hits from your shovel have a lot of weight to them too, so smacking baddies around feels a lot more fun and impactful than throwing your 500th lemon at someone. <laughs> 
Dude, I told you to stop like 400 lemons ago. You and your trusty shoveler are all you really need in order to bounce your way to the credits. And although Shovel Knight's base moveset may be simple, the levels do a great job of stretching it to its absolute limits and leaves you with a character that is easy to learn, but hard to master. So the game looks great and it's really fun to jump around in, but there's gotta be more to it than that, right? Where's the special sauce that really makes Shovel Knight shine amongst all the competition? Well, if we can go back to talking about the levels for a minute, and more specifically, the way that these levels are designed, that's where the genius of Shovel Knight's gameplay really starts to shine. The designs of these levels really does deserve to be highlighted, and in so many different ways. There's exploration elements with hidden passageways, which will have you looking over every pixel of every screen you walk through just in case there's something even slightly out of place you can give a smack to with your shovel. Just knowing that there could be a breakable wall hiding in plain sight stops you from taking things for granted, and everything that comes across the screen feels worth your time to investigate, because more often than not, you'll be rewarded for doing so. But good game design goes far beyond just having secrets to find in your levels. One of the greatest tools in a game developer's toolkit is something referred to as conveyance. Conveyance is a term used to describe the ability of a game to teach a player its rules and mechanics without explicitly telling them what to do. If you're ever playing a game and you think to yourself, wow, all these mandatory tutorials and pop-up dialogue boxes interrupting the action are super annoying. Do the developers seriously think I'm so much of a goddamn idiot I couldn't figure out I need to press X to punch someone? Well, that's bad conveyance. And before you ask, yes, this will universally make you as a player feel stupider than the process they use to choose the name of a Kingdom Hearts game. Good conveyance, on the other hand, feels great. This means that the game lets you figure out how to play it through your own sense of exploration in generally safe environments, and then it will provide you with challenges that use the skills you learned all on your own. And I'm telling you, this introductory planes level is right up there with Mega Man X's opening in terms of teaching by design. Can't get out of the pit, but you're still alive? That's weird, I guess I'm stuck. I'll just hit buttons randomly, I guess, until, <gasps> wow, you can jump up walls. I guess I better do that for the rest of the game! Can't get past this dirt block below you? Well, that's weird. I guess I'm stuck. Time to hit buttons randomly until I- <gasps> Whoa! You can bounce off your shovel and hit things below you! I guess I better do this for the rest of the game! This style of level design is not something that's easy to do, but it's done really well here and continues through each and every level in the game. Most levels have two or three brand new mechanics to face off against in the environments before you're through them, but this design philosophy makes it so that instead of feeling overwhelmed by all the new things being thrown at you, you just feel a sense of accomplishment once you're through them. Yacht Club always makes sure that any new stage element you encounter will be in a place you can experiment with it. Control Old, closed off areas with little risk are a great way to let the player get familiar with something new at their own pace, and test how it works in as many ways as they want. And Shovel Knight does this so seamlessly, it's sometimes hard to notice it's even happening through your initial feelings of, <gasps> what even is that thing? Then gradually the stage will build up more and more dangerous and complex uses of the mechanic until you're eventually faced with a downright deadly environment which, once passed, feels like a victory all on its own. Shovel Knight really is a poster boy for what good conveyance looks and feels like, and I think this is a major part of what makes the game so fun to play. And of course, this all ties in with the difficulty of the platforming itself, which I found to ramp up quite perfectly throughout the levels and throughout the game as a whole. You'll end up requiring more and more advanced techniques as you get ever closer to the Tower of Fate, but it ramps up perfectly, and you never feel like you're being thrown in over your head by an unexpected jump in difficulty. So there you go. The game's levels are extremely well constructed from a design standpoint and are really rewarding to work your way through. But there is one more gameplay element I haven't talked about yet. One more core mechanic that shows the brilliance of Shovel Knight's design. And it all has to do with what happens when you suck. If there's one gaming trope that can be left in the past forever, its lives. Sure, back in the day when a cartridge could only hold so much data and an hour long game needed to last you for weeks, extra lives made sense. You were forced to get better at the game and die less to make it to the end, and by the time you were finished with the game you would feel like you had totally mastered it. Of course, even back then there was some cases of unforgivably difficult design that would make you want to snap your controller in half, 
but overall, the trope of extra lives made sense for this era of gaming. Nowadays though, most games that use a life system seem to either endlessly rain them from the sky, causing them to quickly become meaningless and add nothing to the game by existing, or there are too few lives given to the player over the course of the game, making the challenges feel unforgiving and causing game over screens to constantly kick you out of the action and waste your time. Shovel Knight knows this, and it has a much more elegant solution to punish player deaths. Instead of using an outdated extra life system, each level has a number of checkpoints that once passed will be your point of revival if you happen to die soon after. That's genius! I know, revolutionary, right? Well, give me a second. Also connected to this system is the main collectible and currency in Shovel Knight, which is treasure. You'll find it out in the open as well as inside blocks or enemies, and you can use it to buy various upgrades throughout the game. Each time you die though, you lose a percentage of the treasure you're holding, even if it's from a previous level, and you only have one opportunity to work your way back to where you died to reclaim it. So I guess you could say <laughs> that Shovel Knight is the Dark Souls of platforming games, <laughs> right? Right? Am I right? Ow! If you've recently cleared a checkpoint, you'll respawn there and are pretty likely to find your way back to your treasure and hopefully avoid making the same mistake twice. However, if you do happen to die again before you can make your way back to grab your winged bags of goodies, you can say goodbye to all those precious gems you were working so hard to get back because they'll be gone for good as you drop a new set of bags when you die for the second time. In general, the more treasure you collect, the more careful you should be in making tight jumps or facing a tough enemy. But as long as you've gone by a checkpoint recently, you should be pretty safe. Well, not exactly. There is one more risk to consider in this treasure hunting business of yours. You see these flaming gems inside of each checkpoint's glass ball? Well, after triggering a checkpoint, if the treasure hunter in you simply can't resist some extra dough, it can be broken open and you'll be free to snatch up all of its contents. However, as you may have guessed by now, breaking a checkpoint open means you will not respawn there upon your next death. The broken checkpoint will be completely unusable for the rest of your time in the level, all because you couldn't resist its shiny, shiny contents. Shame on you. Trying to manage your need between a close respawn or taking a risk to get the extra treasure when you don't know what challenges lie ahead makes for a great internal conflict as the player. And this is a billion and one times more interesting than just watching an extra life counter go down in the corner of the screen. This checkpoint system also functions like the relics and lets the player scale the difficulty to their own liking, using as many or as few checkpoints as they think is required for any particular level. This back and forth between the instinct to use the extra safety nets the game gives you, while also having the game entice you to go for the more risky play style is a gaming innovation that I really enjoyed playing around with. It's unlike any checkpoints I've seen in any other games, and the best part is, none of it is forced onto you. You get to decide everything about how often the checkpoints help or hinder you throughout your playthrough. Even if you decide not to use this mechanic at all, and you leave every single gem behind, trapped forever inside every single checkpoint, the fact that the option is there is inherently exciting, and you'll always be able to feel the slight temptation of the red or pink glow every single time you walk by. I don't need it. I don't need it. I definitely don't need it. I 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 need it. So that's the main gameplay of this game, but there are a few other things to do in Shovel Knight as well. There's collectible music sheets that are a way to get some extra treasure, and also unlock parts of the soundtrack in the music player, in the form of an NPC, of course. Outside of the levels, you have isolated character encounters on the world map, areas with small side quests to keep you busy, extra treasure hunts, and full-fledged towns with plenty of characters to talk to and shops to peruse. There's even extra armor sets you can buy that will not only give you different abilities and moves so you can tailor your gameplay experience to your preferred playstyle, but also change Shovel Knight's appearance, which is pretty cool. Though arguably the most vanilla out of all the Treasure Trove's contents, Shovel of Hope is the perfect introduction to Shovel Knight's world. The creative concepts on display just combine perfectly with the tight gameplay and beautiful visuals. This game will keep you entertained for hours on end. And I didn't even talk about the music. My god, the music's good. There's nothing else I can even say that will do it justice. Just go listen to it on YouTube or something, because wow, this is a great soundtrack. As the first campaign that most players will experience, Shovel of Hope does a great job of showing you what there is to love about Shovel Knight. And trust me, there is a lot 
to love. If you haven't had a chance to play Shovel Knight before, I cannot recommend it enough. It's got everything you need for any kind of player under the sun. If you want to get in, have a blast, and get out in a couple hours, or if you want to spend as much time as you can looking over every nook and cranny the game has to offer, either way, you're guaranteed to have a good time. And that's going to do it for this video. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. If you did, that probably means you liked the video, so consider leaving a like and maybe tell me in the comments what campaign you think I should cover next. Other than that, that's pretty much it for me, so th WHAT?!